So what's this first week about? Christians in a pickle jar. What the? Well, it's about pickles. I mean, I don't know about you, but it's all about sweet pickles for me. You know, I'm more of a dill guy myself. No, dill is dill is really bad. You, you put a sweet pickle in your mouth? That's disgusting. Sweet pickles is the way to go. No, really, what's this thing about? It's, it's I don't know. Uh-oh. Well, howdy, West Side. I got a lot of great memories growing up, but one of them is an every spring thing that happened. Uncle Johnny had several thousand acres, ran several thousand head of cattle, and we did spring roundup. Uh, once a year, phenomenal time. We had to gather the cows, we had to brand them, we had to inoculate them. It gave me a little bit of feel for what Western life was really about and gave me a lot of respect for Uncle Johnny along the way. We begin a series today called Cow Tipping. And I'm excited about this series for several reasons. Number one, I'm back. I was out all of July, spent the first two weeks in a study break chasing God, trying to hear from Him. Spent the next two weeks on vacation chasing my wife. <laughs> That's all I'm going to say about that. And I am thrilled to be back. Secondly, I'm looking forward to this series because I know a little bit about cows. But thirdly, I'm looking forward to this series because I feel like I know a whole lot about sacred cows about those things that we believe but we're not always willing to examine to see if they really hold up to the light of Scripture. Find your notes right now. When you glance at them, you're going to see, wow, there's a lot of stuff for us to cover. In fact, this is a great day for you to start taking notes because there's no way you can take in all the content of today without writing some things down. Let's start out by talking about a sacred cow. What is that? Here's the definition. Sacred cows are commonly held beliefs that are considered to be immune from question or criticism. Something that's just something you believe so strong that you won't even consider whether it's accurate or not. You wouldn't even consider whether it's, it's actually true. I grew up with uh, two guys who went to middle school and high school together in North Dallas, and uh, literally Phil lived two houses down, and Jeff lived across the street. And in terms of what we believed, we could not have been more different. For example, Phil came from a very, very strict religious background where he believed and was taught you had to go to church. If you didn't go to church, you went to hell. Now, folks, let's be honest. If the, if the choice is hell or church, church ain't a bad choice. And they went. They went continually. They weren't very involved, but their belief was you had to go. In my house, the belief was you're supposed to go. I've shared with you before how my dad said, if you stay in his house Saturday night, you're going Sunday morning. But it wasn't because you were going to go to hell if you didn't go. It was just because that's what you did. If you were a Christian, you went to church. Jeff across the street had the best world in my kid opinion because his parents believed you didn't have to go to church. In fact, you can just do church anywhere you wanted to. Do you see the difference? Have to go, supposed to go, don't need to go. There's no way all three of those are correct. They cannot be. There's some sacred cow in there somewhere. Same set of ideas when it came to rules in general. Phil's parents believed there were a hundred rules and you had to keep them all. You got to God by keeping the rules. My parents believe there were lots of rules and you were supposed to keep them. Jeff's family were the original owners of Outback. No rules, just right. I mean, they absolutely believed there weren't any rules that mattered. And if there were, rule number one was break all the rules. By definition, all three of those cannot be correct. There's some sacred cow in here somewhere. We've all got some beliefs that we've not really held up to Scripture to see if they're true or not. So I want you to turn to your neighbor and say carefully to them, don't say you are a sacred cow, say you have some sacred cows. Go ahead and tell them. <laughs> you have some sacred cows. We need to deal with those. Second idea about sacred cow, would you write it in? There can be a problem because many times they're based on non-biblical ideas. They can be a problem because they're based on non-biblical ideas. Can I give you a quick one? I hear people say all the time, God's will will be done. Where did you get that? That's not a biblical idea. Examine it and see. There were kids abused in Kansas City last night. Do you think that was God's will? 
I'm pretty convinced it wasn't. There are kids hungry and homeless today in Kansas City. Are you telling me that's God's will? It is not. There's nowhere in Scripture where it says God's will is always done. That's a sacred cow we've created to make us feel better, to make us basically say, well, it doesn't matter if I screw up, God's will is going to be done anyway. No. God's will is not always done. Do you think God's happy with the condition of this world? I would suggest he is not. So the problem with a sacred cow is you can believe it, and if it's not biblical, it can really mess you up. Here's the third statement about sacred cows. They make great hamburger. (laughs) Would you write that in? What do you do with a sacred cow? You shoot the thing. You eat it. By the way, you vegetarians out there, do not email me. You know, vegetarian comes from the ancient Greek word that means bad hunter. (laughs) We got a lot of sacred cow, guys. We got to loosen up and we got to deal with it. So here's the big idea for this series. Jesus expects us, not wants us, not hopes we will. He expects us to examine our beliefs in the light of Scripture. He expects us to take the stuff we believe and examine it in the light of Scripture. Now, how do we do that? Well, notice what Scripture says. This is really a big thing. All Scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. Can I stop right there? God doesn't give you Scripture to entertain you. He does not give us Scripture to make us feel better about ourselves. It says right there, He gives us Scripture to teach us what's true and make us realize what's wrong in our lives. Look at the rest of it. It corrects us when we're wrong, and it teaches us to observe what is right. If you turn to logic to consider if your beliefs are correct, then you're only going to be as good as you are smart. And let me just say it, we're not that smart. 600 years ago, the greatest scientific minds of the day thought the world was flat. They missed it. A hundred years from now, the greatest scientific minds are going to be saying, do you know what those clowns taught in the 21st century? You won't believe where they missed it. We don't want to just base it on our logic if you base your beliefs only on emotion then you only have the solid, solid theology in the areas where your heart's right. What do you do in the areas when your heart's wrong? Scripture says our hearts are wicked and deceitful. I mean, sometimes my heart is pretty cool and pretty altruistic, and sometimes I just want to smack somebody. I can have both sets of emotions. I don't want a theology that's based on that. No, my belief has to be based on what Scripture says if I'm going to have a sense of what God says is right and wrong, what is true and what is false, and base my life on that. In other words, write it in. We should have no sacred cows. No sacred cows. We ought to be able to take any belief we have, hold it up to Scripture and say, is this a true belief? Is this a true conviction? If it's true, hang on to it. And if it's not, turn it loose. I believe that if Jesus were looking at our society today, 21st century American Christians, he'd probably say the same thing that he said to the people of his day. Here's the question. What happens when we do not examine our beliefs in the light of Scripture? What happens when we just believe what we've always believed? We just believe what makes sense to us. We just believe what we feel. Here's what Jesus said. These people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. They've let go of the commands of God and are holding on to human tradition. I don't think that's ever been truer in America than it is right now. We're putting logic on the throne of God. We're putting emotion on the throne of God. We are not putting Scripture as our way to find the truth of God. So that's what we're going to be doing for the next few weeks, looking at sacred cows. Now, why is this a big deal? Because what we believe, look this way, church, eventually determines who we become. What we believe eventually 
determines who we become. If you believe that all religions can get you to heaven, you eventually will talk to nobody about Jesus. Because why bother? He's not the only way to get there. If you believe that God is really not serious about sin, then you'll quit dealing with your sin. Why bother if God doesn't care? What we believe determines who we become. And the only filter we have for what we believe is holding it up to the Scripture. So let's tip some cows. Let's take on some sacred animals. Here's today's sacred cow. Listen carefully, because the first part of this sacred cow is accurate. It's the second part that gets us in trouble. Here's the sacred cow. It goes like this. Jesus saves us. He keeps us. No, let me start over. Jesus picks us, he saves us, and he keeps us, and that's all there is to it. Jesus, God himself, picks us, that means he chose you. He saves you, that means he gives you forgiveness. And he keeps you, that means he guarantees you heaven. And that's all there is to it. Now listen carefully, church. The first part of that statement is totally true. And the second part of that statement is totally false. Does God pick us? Absolutely. Does he save us? Sure. Does he keep us? He does. Is that all there is to it? No. That's the start. I grew up in a church who every week, 52 weeks a year, we either heard, hey, God chose you and he knew you before the foundation of the earth. And that's true. Or we heard, Jesus wants to save you, and he wants to forgive you of sins, and that's true. And Jesus will keep you once you've grabbed his hand. He never turns loose of yours. That's true. And that was all. That was all. It's sort of like going to the first inning of a baseball game and leaving after the first inning. Now, with the Royals, that might be good. <laughs> Sometimes we're ahead at the end of the first inning. But it's like leaving at the first inning and saying we're done. It's like taking in the first quarter of a football game, thank God we're going to have football, and then leaving and deciding you've seen the whole show. Why have I called this lesson Christians in a Pickle Jar? I grew up with my grandmother having an acre garden on her farm. Oh, she kept all kinds of crops that she raised commercially and kept, kept horses for folks and had chickens and did all the things that she did back then. But she had one acre spot that she worked by herself as her personal garden. And I watched her year after year after year go out and pick the cucumbers, bring them in and fix them and treat them, turn them into sweet pickles. That was me arguing for the sweet pickles. How many are sweet pickle fans? How many are dill pickle fans? What's the matter with you folks? <laughs> Don't you know when you eat dill, you get sour? She'd turn them into the greatest pickles, and she'd preserve them. She'd, she'd take them and put them in those quart jars, those mason jars. You remember those? Had a flat lid you put on first, and then a twisted lid you put on, and you sealed them up. And she would have them done. And I would think, man, what a deal. She picked them, she saved them. She's keeping them. No. The point of pickles is to give them away. And she did. She did. All through the years, she'd give them out to her neighbors. In the middle of winter, when there was nothing to eat, to raise, she would hand them out. She would take them to her friends. Christians in a pickle jar. Too many of us have bought into the idea that Jesus picked you. He did. He saved you. That's true. And he's keeping you absolutely. And we think it's just about being in the jar. No. Here's the truth. Write it in. Here's what we're going to explore today. The truth of Scripture is God does pick us. He does save us. And he does keep us. No doubt. But that is only the start. He also calls us. He also sends us. And he also uses us. And we are doing people a disservice if we teach the first half of this truth and not the second half. Have you ever thought about this? What was Jesus' number one invitation to other people? 
What was it? Some people say it was believe. Not true. Count the number of times he said it, not even close. Some people would say it was to be saved. Not true. Talked about that, but it was not the number one invitation. His number one invitation was four words. Come and follow me. Again and again and again and again. How have we turned it into just believe or just be saved when his real invitation is come and follow me? I want you to read this scripture out loud with me, and then we're going to spend the rest of our time unpacking it. Jesus said, come and follow me, and I will send you out to fish for people. Three phrases, circle them, would you? First circle, come and follow me. We're going to talk about that. And then circle, I will send you out. Second phrase. And then lastly, circle, to fish for people. Check this out. There's an invitation in what Jesus says to all of us. Would you write that word in? There's an invitation, and that is Jesus calls us. He says, come and follow me. Hey, pretend with me for a minute. Let's pretend that I get a call this afternoon from the White House. It is from the president's press secretary. And he says, hey, Dan, the president's looking for somebody to hang out with every day, and he'd like to know if you'd be available to meet every morning, first thing in the morning, with him. First of all, I'm not taking that invitation for several reasons that we won't discuss right now. But let's kick it up a notch. The God of this universe has sent every single one of us an invitation that says, I'd like to meet with you every day. I'd like to hang with you every day. I'd like to talk with you every day. In fact, I'm inviting you to follow me, to follow me, not just Twitter me, to follow me. That's the invitation that is ours. And sometimes I think we're so stuck in the pickle jar, we're afraid to get out and to accept the invitation. God is calling us. There's the invitation part. But check it out. It goes deeper than that. There's an ordination. There's an ordination. Some of you going, big word, big word. Actually, what we ought to be saying is biblical word, Biblical word, ordination literally means that you have sent someone. You have sent them with a mission. Jesus said, come and follow me and I will send you out. There's an ordination. How many of you have teenagers that are old enough now to drive? You got those? I don't quite understand why some parents don't let their kids immediately get their license. Now, that's a personal parenting thing, and I just got some of you in trouble, but here's how it worked for me. I couldn't wait to send my kid to the grocery store. I couldn't wait to say to him, you are the taxi service for your younger sister. You are going to run every errand that comes up. You're going to the grocery store so your mama can ask you why you got the wrong thing that was on the list. <laughs> I am commissioning you, boy. I am sending you. You're going to do my bidding. That's the deal. You get a license, you're going to do what dad says to do. That was awesome. God has ordained us. He wants to send us to do his bidding. And if that bidding is an errand, so be it. And if that bidding is a task, so be it. And if that bidding is something that counts for eternity, wow, bring it on, so be it. The preservation idea says, no, it's safe. Stay in the pickle jar. You know, the being kept idea says, oh, no, 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 I don't, I'm never going to let you out. If you read a harmony of the Gospels, which is simply the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, put in one book in chronological order, check this out. Four months after Jesus called his initial 12 disciples, he sent them out two by two on their own. 
didn't put them through a two-year training class, sent them out. God has called us, no doubt. That's the invitation. God has sent us, no doubt. That's the ordination. Check out this third part. There's an expectation. Jesus wants to use us. There's an expectation. Come and follow me, he said. I will send you out. He was very upfront, and he told us what to do. To fish for people. I got a great email a couple of weeks ago. Didn't touch email for a couple of weeks. If you sent me something, I'm still catching up. But that's called vacation. Turned off the phone. Turned off the email. It was glorious. It was absolutely awesome. But I got a phenomenal email that I've already read through that said, Dan, just want to tell you, God's really been speaking through the teachings that you and the other pastors have been doing. It's really made a difference in my life. It's clear that God uses you guys. Can you talk to me a little bit about how that works? I'd like to see God use me as well. And my response back went something like this. Hey, thanks for the kind words. I am amazed when God uses any of us. But here's how it works. Don't miss this. Catch it all. God uses me because I expect God to use me. And I expect God to use me because he's promised that he will. Now, if the statement is simply, God uses me because I expect him to, that's arrogance. That sounds like it's all about me. No, God uses us because we expect him to, and we expect him to because he's promised to use us. Jesus said, follow me. I will send you out to fish for people. One of the things that I did the last two weeks is we spent a week in the Florida Keys, and it was awesome. It was fun. It's just an amazing, amazing time. Fishing is always fun. It's just always fun. There's not enough time in life to fish. I saw a bumper sticker long, long ago that said, all time spent fishing is never wasted time. I agree. It was incredible. But here's the thing. Write this in your notes. If we land on God picks us and saves us and keeps us, and that's all there is, write this in, then it's all about me. Here's the problem with a Christian in a pickle jar theology. It makes us think it's all about us. God chose me because I'm awesome. It's all about me. God saved me because he wanted me. It's all about me. God keeps me because I am one of his favorites. It's all about me. And it's absolute truth that God picks us and saves us and keeps us, but that's not all there is. That philosophy, though, write this in, leads to a self centered life. I'm going to go straight at it, church. You ready? The most self-centered people I've ever met are all in church. Did you hear that? They're absolutely convinced that the God of the universe chose them because they were the best, saved them because he had to have them, and keeps them because they're worth keeping. And they've taken a true piece of theology, and because they've quit on it in the first inning of the game, they've never moved on to God also calls us and also sends us and also uses us. Now, what happens if we do grab the whole thing? Write this in as well. If we do understand that God also calls us and sends us and uses us, then life becomes all about others. Do you hear the difference? We can't be the church that says it's 104 and no more. It's just about us. Because there are thousands that don't know him yet. And the life that truly catches that life becomes a service-centered life. I started telling you about the keys. This is the 16th year in a row that my son and I and some of his buddies have gone fishing. Uh, this year, particularly lobstering. We do it every year, starting when he's 12 years old. We take a week. Last week in July, it's lobster mini season. Here's the cool part of lobstering in the Keys. You free dive for lobster. You basically put on snorkels and a fin and fins, and you hope you can catch them. It's kind of a combination between fishing and hunting. You're going after the lobster. And on Tuesday, the last Tuesday of July, we go out and we look for the lobster. 
because the season doesn't start till the last Wednesday of July. You can look on Tuesday, but you can't touch them. So we do a lot of diving and a lot of looking and a lot of lobstering. In other words, a lot of fishing. But the fun starts on Wednesday morning when you can catch them. Fishing is fun, but the real fun begins when the catching begins. God wants to use us, not just to say, hey, I'm in the boat, I'm safe, and I'm going to be preserved and make it to shore. But he wants to use us to say, who else can you get in the boat? Who else can be saved? Who else can we rescue and get safely to shore? Last thought for you, would you write it in? What do you believe? Which of those lives do you want? The first inning life that's self-centered or the whole ball game theology that says it's about others? Thanks for how you've listened today. Next week, we're going to talk about Jesus and politics. You don't want to miss it. I guarantee you I'm going to offend everybody in the place. (laughs) Because any political party that thinks they've got a claim on Jesus does not understand who Jesus really is.